I'm going to introduce Allison. She is with the Utah Department of Human Services and she's a suicide prevention administrator. Um, we're very fortunate to have her here today to present and kind of go over all of this stuff we need to understand about suicide and how to prevent suicide. So with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Allison and let her start her presentation. Thanks, Heather. I'm so happy to see so many of you on here today. Um, I do like to do a bit of sort of an informal presentation, meaning I really will ask for a lot of discussion. Um, that is a little bit different on an online platform, but, um, you know, Heather has graciously agreed to bear with me through those discussions. So, um, you know, I think one of my favorite things about this whole social distancing situation we're all in is that we get to see each other be a little bit more human. So if you hear my dogs or <laughs> go crazy for the Amazon truck or anything like that, please uh, be a little bit understanding. Um, that's just kind of where we're all at these days. So I'm so excited to be here with you today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, suicide prevention and sort of what we can do to protect, protect our families, our loved ones, our coworkers, and all that sort of during this time. Um, you know, so I, I think our mind is all currently, you know, we're all focused so much on what is going on with um, physical health right now with COVID-19, right? That's all we hear about. Um, and so it kind of seems strange to be focusing on another public health issue, to be focusing on suicide prevention, um, another really large uh, heavy topic, but this is a really, really important time to be t discussing suicide prevention. So I am really excited to see, you know, over a hundred of you on here today. Um, we do know that just broadly, a lot of people are at increased risk during this time. Um, some of the reasons for that, obviously, are we're all socially isolated. Um, some of us don't have, you know, even family members that we live with. We live alone, and so this can increase. Um, feelings of stress, anxiety, depression. Um, a lot of us are also experiencing life stress um, that this sort of uh, pandemic has brought upon us in terms of job loss, financial stress, and just this uncertainty about the future. And so this really is um, a crucial time to be talking about this and to be talking about how we can support each other um, through all of this. Um, you know, we are monitoring at the state level changes to know to see if we see increases in crisis calls or increases in attempts or deaths for suicide so that is currently being monitored we're well aware um so far no significant changes um you know nothing to sort of note i think some people this is especially for our youth when we talk about this like they're they're home they're maybe feeling a little less stressed not in school they're um, home with their families maybe connecting a little bit more and so it's been interesting to watch just so that you know i just wanted to mention that just so that you know it is something that is being watched uh, and we are aware of it <clears throat> as i go through this presentation today i want you to really think about the many hats that we all wear um, so you know our role as a family member as a classmate as a friend as a coworker. Um, as a faith leader, whatever that might be for you, think about the multiple hats you wear, the multiple types of people you come in contact with in your workplace and in your personal life, and how this information can help you in all of those different roles. You will notice as I go through my presentation that I am using a certain type of language when I'm talking about suicide, um, meaning, rather than saying something like committed suicide that's a very common sort of way to refer to suicide as somebody committed suicide but when you think about what the word committed generally is associated with it's usually associated with fairly negative things uh, committed murder committed a crime right and it has that negative feel to it and when we're talking about suicide and we really want to frame it as a mental health issue and encourage people to, to seek help, we really need to take away any sort of language that can be a little bit stigmatizing like that. So rather than saying, you know, committed suicide, we would say something like they died by suicide or they took their own life, right? Because again, as this public health issue, um, you wouldn't say that somebody committed cancer Right, and so um, framing this the same that we would any other health issue is gonna be extremely important. Um, 
And the same kind of thing, you know, when we hear unsuccessful suicide or failed suicide attempt, right, for somebody who already feels like, you know, maybe I can't do anything right, and they're considering taking their own life. Well, now I can't even do this right. Right. So, so rather than referring to that negative side of things, referring to them as survivors, because that's what they are. Um, they went through a really, really dark time and they came through it. Right. So again, you'll sort of see me through this presentation. I'm going to be using terms died by suicide, took his or her own life. And these are easy changes that we can all make in our personal lives. This is thing that we can do, you know, even not working in the mental health field at all. This is something that we can do. And we know that changing our language can help people feel safer to ask for help, which means that changing language can actually save lives. So I encourage you all to sort of be, be thinking about this um, and try to incorporate it into your own life. Um, I normally try to show some sort of video to frame this beginning of this discussion, um, but I couldn't get my sound to work on the video. Um, so I want to explain a little bit about what is happening when somebody is having thoughts of suicide. When somebody is having thoughts of suicide, this doesn't actually mean that they want to die. It just means that they don't know how to live. They don't know how to get through this physical or emotional pain that they're experiencing. And so um, when somebody is having thoughts of suicide, it's actually more of an ambivalence about death, meaning part of them wants to live, but part of them actually wants to die. And so it's just kind of this internal battle they're having right up until the point where they decide they're going to make an attempt on their own life. Um, but what our job is, when we talk about suicide prevention and what we can do, we can help connect to the part of them that wants to live. And if we can speak to that side of them, we can save their life. Um, the good news is, is that most people who experience thoughts of suicide do not actually go on to die by suicide as long as they are connected with effective treatment and they have uh, social supports to help get them through that. So that's sort of where we all come in as this social support. I'm gonna go through a little bit of data and this is where I like to have a little bit of a discussion. Um, you know, let's do this one first. So I like to have a little bit of a discussion around the data and kind of get us thinking um, about suicide death and what is actually happening in our country and in our state when we talk about suicide. So suicide is the sixth, or Utah is the sixth in the nation for suicide deaths. Okay, so you'll see these red numbers indicate the top 10 states, one through 10. Um, you'll notice that many of the top 10 states for suicide deaths are in this Intermountain West region in that sort of box I've outlined. So start chatting in for me. Um, we'll see how this goes. Start chatting in for me. What are some reasons as to why we might have these increased numbers out here in the West specifically? No wrong answers, just kind of a brainstorming. What are some reasons as to why? Because winters are forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, lack of sun, right? Sunlight. Um, some people said poverty, religion, seasonal depression, not enough sun, sunshine, social pressure, higher expectations due to religion, low population density, and isolation. Uh, lots of good ones, lots of and good access ones. access to mental health care. You know, we also have, don't we have the youngest uh, population in the nation? And mm -hmm. also by age, um, suicide also hits a certain age demographic harder than it does others. Yeah, good points, good points. Thank you for being uh, brave enough to speak out loud too. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, you know, um, I love this piece to be a little bit interactive and throw out all of these ideas because I think, you know, the point of this slide is really not to give you an answer, unfortunately. The point of this slide is to talk about really the complexity of suicide and that, you know, I would like to think that if it was one thing and one reason why we were seeing increased rates out here in the West, we would have figured it out by now and our rates would be on the decline. Um, but unfortunately, su suicide um, is such a complex issue. There, is, there are so many different things on a societal level, on an individual level that really do play into this. And so um, 
you know, it's just, it, it really takes a comprehensive approach to suicide prevention, right? It cannot be just myself and my staff at the state office. It cannot just be our healthcare systems. It cannot all rely on our school systems. We have to think about what our roles are as individuals, what we can do to connect with people, to build positive relationships, to remind people of um, why they want to live, right? We have to figure out what our role is in all these different you know, domains when I talked about the different hats you wear and just work together uh, to reduce suicides. So thank you all for chatting in. Um, so this is another, this is an interesting slide that I think will address some of the, the comments that came in. So suicide is a lifespan issue, okay? Um, so what, you know, go ahead and chat in on this one as well. What is something that stands out to you about this slide that maybe is particularly interesting or surprising? Um, so you'll notice that this is death per 100,000 by age. Okay, so on the left is ages 10 to 17, on the right is all the way 85 plus, orange is female, and blue is male. What are some of the things that stand out to you about this one? Um, some people are saying the elderly, so it's surprising that 85 plus is so high. Yeah, think about what's happening at that age in life, right? Um, you know, maybe spouses are dying, friends are dying, you're retired, no longer working. So maybe there's some sort of like lack of feeling like you have a purpose or reason to wake up, right? And there's that isolation component where you don't have as many social networks as you used to have. Sometimes chronic pain or health conditions at that age, right? So definitely an age group we do not talk about enough. Yep, and then other comments was that the male males are much higher than females. Yeah, yeah, so men tend to use a more lethal method. Um, that's, that's generally the reason for this um, difference in data. Men tend to use something more like a firearm, which is pretty um, lethal, right? Versus if some, you know, a woman who may use um, prescription medication or something like that, and there's an opportunity to intervene and get them to healthcare, right? Okay, and someone asked, how come we don't talk about elderly being suicidal as much? Why don't we hear about that? Um, I would I would say, um, in in my opinion, I think a lot of it has to do with, I mean, everything we see in the media is that age 10 to 17, right? As, that is what gets attention. I think it almost becomes acceptable not for our field of course but when people hear about elderly dying from suicide they're like well they lived a good life right versus somebody who is 10 11 12 17 how much life and how many years lost by taking their own life right and so i think it gets a lot more media attention that 10 to 17 age group um i think there's been a lot of articles around you know suicide is the leading cause of death in Utah for youth age 10 to 17. And that actually is a very, that's a true statistic. That's not wrong. Um, but putting a little context to it is important because youth don't actually die very often. And so when you talk about leading cause of death in our middle aged and older adult population, suicide is up against heart disease and, you know, cancer and car crashes and all these other health issues where, you know, youth are experiencing a lot of those health issues. And so an intentional death jumps very quickly up to the leading cause of death for that age group. And so it gets a lot of hype, a lot of attention being the leading cause of death. Um, but I think that's why I like to have this discussion around the data because I think it's, it's a data point that is sometimes misconstrued, right? Um, because youth suicide deaths make up 6% of suicide deaths in the state of Utah, six. Um, and while every single youth life lost is absolutely tragic, it's a much broader conversation. And we need to be talking about this middle-aged working population and our older adults. So a couple questions before you move on. Um, someone said, I know this is a whole can of worms, but do these numbers include assisted suicides? I know it's not legal here, but on a global scale, are those lives included in statistics? 
No, they are not. That's a very separate data pool. Um, we're talking about more like deaths of despair, people who, um, yeah, so it's, it's kept very separate in the data world. So that's a good question. Assisted suicides are not included. And then the next question is, so are the attempts of suicide more equaled out between gender? So you had said that men are more lethal than women. Yeah, so no, great point. So yeah, if we were to look at attempt data, um, this is where it's really important to not just focus on men, because if we were to look at attempt data, this would look very different. Females actually attempt more, but males die more. So definitely an interesting thing to keep in mind for sure that we need to be thinking about this across all genders. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Thank you. Um, I won't spend much time on this because this is a very sort of overwhelming slide and it's a, it looks a little bit small on my presentation, but this is a new uh, piece of data that we haven't quite publicly released yet, but I wanted to discuss just because I know a lot of you are joining today from work sites um, from across the state. And so I wanted to just sort of show when we talk about our working age population and how on that previous slide I just showed that working age population is at particularly high risk, this breaks it down into what exactly, what industries are we seeing the higher rates of suicide in? Um, and so how can we partner with those industries? How can we change the culture of those industries to pr promote mental health and reduce suicides among folks? So you'll notice by far, uh, the construction and extraction industry is very, very high. Um, right up there is installation, maintenance, repair, uh, farming is also up there. Um, so, so sort of interesting to think about, right? Um, I will say some of these industries, right, when we look at death data and we talked about how men die more often, Twelve to one. Many, many of these industries are predominantly male industries, right? So the demographics match a little bit um, when we talk about our middle-aged white men dying, kind of matches like the construction industry, um, farming industry, some of those jobs. I would also say that those industries tend to be a little bit more like one transient. People are you know, having to move around for their jobs. So a little bit of instability, um, very dependent on the economy. And like the farming industry is very dependent on having a good weather season, right? Um, so sort of stability, I think, is a big component of all of this. But this is just something to sort of be aware of and to, to really be thoughtful about how we can interact with our coworkers, or if you're in a management position, how you can interact more positively with your employees because you know, this is a, a place where we can really have these conversations. Everybody comes every day. We learn a lot about each other. And so how can we uh, work together to bring down these numbers? Okay, and a couple questions with that. Um, said, where does military fall? Um, I'm trying to see if it's on this one. Sorry, it's a little small. You guys are gonna see me super up close for a minute. <laughs> um, Protective service. Yeah, so it's it's under, thank you. Yes, under protective services would be what it um, would be included under for this report. Uh, we have other reports that break it down a little bit more specifically. We do know like our, you know, law enforcement and military services are kind of high risk industries as well. So um, good question. So I like to kind of end the data section with this quote to be thinking about, right? Because I get asked to do a lot of presentations and what people like to focus on come tell us how many people are dying how many people are we losing to suicide how big of a problem is this in our state but i think we're doing a disservice if we don't talk about the number of people who are living through this who are making it through who are um i think that that's where we can speak to people who are struggling like you can get through this so i'm gonna read this quote uh the corollary more positive statistic the one that is not articulated often enough is that among all these millions who actively consider suicide less than one in every 10 make an attempt on their own lives and of those only a minority ever go on to die by suicide 
This means that in every community in the country, every part of the world, we're living among people who have faced the worst of personal pain and doubt and have come through to better lives. Why is there so little in the public sphere about their trials, triumphs, and truths? And what might they say if they did not need to fear judgment, scrutiny, and stigma? Um, so just encouraging you all, you know, while it's important to know data-wise what is happening in our state, I think it's um, arguably more important to share the stories of recovery and hope so that people know that they're not alone. Um, I do apologize. I'm going to have to keep moving this so I can, <laughs> moving the camera so that I can read my slides. Um, talking kind of broadly about what may cause people to have thoughts of suicide. So I kind of have divided this up into three buckets that this generally sort of falls into. So um, there's the health bucket. So people who maybe have mental health issues or have physical pain or physical illness um, might fall into this bucket. Then we talk about environmental. So things, um, you know, if somebody feels supported in their school or supported in their workplace, um, you know, that could be sort of falling into this bucket. Life experiences is a huge one right now that I think we're talking about. Um, so just some things to be sort of thinking about during COVID-19 right now, a lot of people are experiencing a lot of really stressful life experiences that can, tr can contribute to people having thoughts of suicide. Um, so specifically, like if they are losing their job or having uh, financial stress, people are feeling lonely um, and just this uncertainty about the future. And we're all kind of in the same bucket, right? This is why this is such a high risk time and why this is such an important conversation to be having. Um, we're all feeling this way in one way or another. And so we need to be able to pay close attention to our friends, our families, um, and our coworkers during this time. Um, but kind of all of these three buckets very broadly, um, we have more in-depth trainings on this, um, but they're not approved to be delivered online. So that's why we're just sort of like basically just glazing over this a little bit, but there are other trainings available for you to learn more about risk and protective factors and, um, and things like that. So the good news is though, is that, um, protective factors exist. And there's a lot of really, really strong protective factors. Um, so a risk factor, right, that we talked about on the previous slide, increases somebody's risk that they might attempt suicide. But a protective factor buffers against that risk, right? The risk might still be there, but this can help buffer and keep them safe, right? And so, so there are certain things that people have on an individual level, right, like coping skills, healthy coping skills, um, there and then there are sort of these broader layers that can protect them on a relationship level, a community level, and sort of a state society level. One that I think is particularly important to point out right now um, during this pandemic and this stressful time is the importance of that social and family connection, right? Um, you know, we keep hearing over and over and over social distancing, right? But I think we need to start rethinking that. And this is physical distancing. This is not social distancing. Um, it is more important now than ever to connect socially. We just have to do it a little bit differently, right? Um, but connection is one of our biggest protective factors for suicide um, just in general because it helps people develop coping attitude, healthy coping attitudes and behaviors. Um, it helps increase the number of referrals for people who are in distress and get them connected to help. It helps people feel safe to ask for help when they are struggling. Um, and it gives people this perception that they have support and that they're not alone during this dark time they might be going through. Um, so a couple tips I think that I can you know, I wanted to touch on um, again during this really unique time and why we need to be thinking about physical distancing, but socially connecting. Um, so there are some things, you know, for those of us who are fortunate enough to live in a home with other family members, you know, taking time to, you know, discuss your family history, to look through photo albums, to write letters or create cards for relatives. Um, going outside and greeting your neighbors, obviously, with your, um, you know, social 
or your safe distances, um, but going outside and greeting neighbors and talking from that safe distance, um, playing card games, board games, uh, doing crafts, writing stories and poetry together, right? Um, all of those are things that we can be doing right now. I will say, you know, many of us, live alone or are not near our families. And so we have to get a little bit more creative with this. And I've seen a lot of really cool things, really unique things come out of, um, out of this physical distancing right now. Um, you know, being able to read stories virtually and join online groups or online support groups and book clubs, sending care packages to people that don't live necessarily close by, um virtual dance parties virtual meetings i know we've been utilizing this a lot in our workspace right is um trying to just connect with people virtually but i've also used it in my personal life on on the weekends i try to have a virtual call with a friend or family member and we talk face to face like this um because it's just extremely important to check in on each other during this time um, attending virtual concerts, I've seen a lot of like cool virtual dance parties going on. Um, there's a lot of organizations that are putting out resources for games and online streaming and things like that that you can do. You know, you need to be, you know, now that we're in, I think it hit me this week that I've been working from home for 45 days now. Right. And so uh, it's extremely, extremely, if it wasn't important before, it's important now um, to find unique ways to connect. Um, this is just going to be so important for all of our mental health. <clears throat> There's also museums doing free virtual tours. So, you know, there are definitely educational things that can be done right now as well. Um, connecting with yourself. Okay. This is also a really important time to be connecting with yourself, taking time to journal or to read, um, to meditate, getting enough sleep, right? Uh, keeping a consistent routine right now, I know sometimes is difficult because, you know, I know for me, at least the first couple of weeks, I was like, man, this is great. I get an extra hour of sleep. So I don't have to worry about waking up and getting ready and commuting, right? And can kind of wake up and walk to my computer. Um, and so, uh, but you kind of lose that routine and that can long term become a little bit difficult for your mental health as well. So keeping a, a sleep routine, making sure you're eating healthy, um, getting up, opening your curtains, getting sunshine in your house and have compassion for yourself and understand that we are all going to have bad days and we're gonna have good days it's kind of a roller coaster during this time but kind of that bottom line is that we need to stay connected with each other and not isolate and be thinking about people you know that live alone um don't just sort of assume that they're okay we need to reach out and ask them directly um you know i have friends and siblings who all live alone right now and so they are social distancing or physical distancing by themselves and that's extremely hard on people's mental health. So, so be thinking about yourself, but also about how you can connect with others. Um, some tips to manage stress and anxiety. Again, I think I touched on this on the last slide, but just taking care of yourself, taking care of your, your body, good hygiene, um, creating a routine, um, make opportunity, find opportunities to learn. There's a lot of like universities doing free online classes. Um, you can use this time to kind of develop some of those additional skills. Um, so just to get a little, just a little bit creative, I just wanted to touch on the importance of that connection piece right now during this time. Um, but I am gonna walk you through a little bit on what to watch for. You know, so we've talked about um, suicide data, we've talked about the importance of connection, but what do we do when we notice that somebody is struggling? You know, what are we even watching for and how do we respond when we do notice something? And so that's what this section is gonna be for. Okay. Um, so first of all, warning signs can display themselves in a number of ways. Um, some things might be said out loud and some things we might observe. So people might say, <clears throat> excuse me, people might say, you know, my family would be better off without me. 
or, you know, I just can't take it anymore. I wish I could go to sleep and never wake up. Okay, so you kind of hear this theme of hopelessness um, in the tone of their voice. And they may not be saying directly that they're, that they're gonna take their own life, but you can kind of, kind of connect the dots, I think, with some of these verbal cues. Other people are very direct and they might say, you know, if such and such doesn't happen tomorrow, I am going to kill myself. Some people might be pretty direct, but oftentimes you'll hear a little bit more of this, um, you know, this indirect, uh, verbal cue. I'll give kind of a personal example. So I was trained in suicide prevention. So it's a training called QPR where we walk much more in depth on these warning signs. I really do encourage you to reach out to me after this presentation and, and set up maybe a training for your work site, um, you know, or community. But I was on a camping trip, you know, I think it was about a year and a half ago now or something. And I had just been, you know, trained on more specific warning signs and and how to have a conversation we do a lot of role playing in that in that training and you know there was like 10 of us around the campfire we're just having a good time and one of my friends said oh my gosh it's been such a rough week i swear if this doesn't happen next week i am going to just i might as well just kill myself right and everybody sort of laughed because it's i mean he definitely said it in a joking way and we were you know everybody kind of laughed it off but I started thinking about the training I had just had or the discussion we're having today. And I just said, you know, that was a little bit off. Um, pulled him aside, had a conversation and just said, you know, hey, you know, you said this earlier and, and I just wanted to check in with you. It seems like you really are going through a stressful time. And it opened up into this broader conversation where, yeah, he was feeling very hopeless and, and like he wanted, he couldn't live anymore. And so, you know, when we got back into cell phone service, we got him connected with services, but, but it just shows, um, you know, how simple these conversations can be and that um you know you just never know when you're going to need to use these skills but we we can't assume that everybody knows all this information so i want to encourage you that when you come out of this today be thinking about everything that you learned and you can't assume that other people know this information and so you have to be the one to sort of reach out and make this connection um other things you might observe so sometimes people don't say any of these things out loud um, but you might observe their behavior changing. You might uh, see changes in their sleep. They might be sleeping too much or they might not be sleeping enough. They may be using more alcohol or drugs than they have before, behaving rec recklessly. Um, so maybe now they're drinking and driving or they're speeding or you know if we're talking about a youth maybe they're skipping class just things that are outside of the norm for them that they're not caring about their future or their safety anymore uh giving away prized possessions if you see specific changes in mood we'll talk a little bit about that one on the next slide but these are all cues that if you notice any of these if you hear any of these this is a good time to just check in with someone just see how they're doing. This is definitely, um, you're watching for any significant change. We know our friends, we know our families better than anyone, right? And so if we notice a significant change, it's always a good time to check in. Uh, so watching for changes in mood. Um, again, I think change is the key term here. Um, so if they're all of a sudden acting depressed, or irritable or acting really impulsive okay if they're more agitated than usual okay these are all cues that somebody is going through something that somebody is going through a stressful time and and you might ask them and the answer you know we'll go through some steps on how to have this conversation but um you know at the very least check in the, the answer might be no like no i'm fine sort of a thing but um i mean any of these things is a good reason to check in. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this already with life experiences, but just being aware of stressful life experiences that friends and family and coworkers are going through. If, if somebody has been expelled from school, somebody has been fired or, you know, lost a major relationship, experienced a death of a loved one, whether that's a child, a spouse, best friend, right? um 
fear of becoming a burden to others. This one, you know, specifically like, so for example, this is just one example, but if, you know, a husband has typically been the provider for his family and now he's lost his job, he might start to feel like maybe he's being a burden to his family, right? Um, so just kind of considering like the different ways that these kind of um, life experiences might play out in somebody's life. Um, but always a good time to check in with people. So if you notice any of those things, whether it's verbally or you notice a change in their behavior or a change in their mood, okay, all of these things, we should probably ask how they're feeling. Um, one of the best things that we can do is ask directly about suicide. So this does not, there's a lot of myths out there that asking about suicide will put the idea in someone's head and that's absolutely not true. There's no research to support that. Um, you know, suicide is not something that, you know, everyone thinks about. So if somebody, generally if you're asking somebody, they've already probably been thinking about it, right? Um, so how to ask directly about suicide. Um, we want to ask directly, okay, so, you know, um, sometimes this feels really uncomfortable, I think, right, that we're encouraging you to ask directly about suicide. Like I said, there's much more in-depth trainings about this, but um, we have to be direct. We have to ask them how they're doing, but a lot of times this comes from a much broader conversation. You're not going to just walk up to someone and just say, hey, are you thinking about suicide, right? Generally, this is... Um, you know, you're having a much broader conversation, talking about a lot of stressful things going on to their in their life, and it it's a much more natural sort of progression than than it might feel like right now. Um, but you know, just kind of opening it up to you know, sometimes people when people are going through what you're going through, they feel like they don't want to live anymore, or sometimes they think about killing themselves. Have you had thoughts like this? Um, you said that you couldn't handle it anymore. When you say that, do you mean that you're thinking about suicide, right? So asking very, very directly, um, because we, we're going to get the answer to the question we ask, right? So if we ask somebody, you know, are you going to hurt yourself? They might be able to say no, because in their mind, what they're going to do is going to remove the pain. Um, and they're not actually going to be hurting themselves. They're going to be taking away their pain. Um, so we need to make sure, again, we're asking the question that we want to know the answer to. And I do apologize. I think I'm in like a group chat or something. I keep hearing dinging on my computer, so I do apologize. Um, so what do we say when the answer is yes, right? I think a lot of times people shy away from asking the question because they don't know what to do if the person says yes. Um, and so we just need to, first of all, validate their feelings, right? You know, thank you so much for being honest with me. I know this can be really hard to talk about. I'm so glad that you told me, and I think I might be able to help, right? Um, validating the pain that they're in, you know, it sounds like you're just going through so much pain, and I'm so sorry you're going through this, right? Um, I don't know about any of you, but I know I'm a fixer. And so, you know, when people are expressing problems going on their, in their life, I like to offer solutions. That's what I like to do. But that's not particularly helpful when we talk about suicide, because when somebody gets to the point that they're thinking about suicide, it's because they feel like they've already exhausted all of their other options, right? And that suicide is the answer. And so we need to be careful not to offer too many solutions and say, well, have you tried this? Well, what about this kind of a thing? We need to just listen. We need to just validate how they're feeling and let them talk through it a little bit um, before jumping into anything. Listening is so powerful. This is probably the most powerful, you know, step in all of this. It can help a person feel loved. It can help a person sort of gain insight into their own thoughts and maybe what they've been thinking about. But it could also give you clues. Um, thinking about what social supports do they have? Who knows about this? What family members do they trust? What coping skills do they have? What kind of activities do they enjoy that might help distract them from these thoughts, right? So it can kind of give us a little bit more insight. I will say, um, 
if you're thinking about what you're going to say next, you're not actually listening, right? So, so just listen. Don't think about how am I going to respond to this. Just listen and validate. Um, make sure you're asking open-ended questions. So, you know, will you tell me what it is that got you to this point? You know, you've obviously been through a lot. Do you mind sharing that with me? Um, and just give them time to talk without jumping in um, with lots of advice or problem solving. Um, you know, be non-judgmental, show empathy, right? This sounds really painful. Um, a lot of people feel this way, right? Kind of normalizing that behavior, um, but all very open-ended and encouraging this person to share what they've been going through because sometimes this is the first time that they've opened up about it. And so we don't want to cut them off. We want to allow them time to talk through it. So I think it's also important to point out that you need to um, allow time, right, to have this conversation. Don't be rushing off to another meeting or rushing off to take your kids somewhere. Be sure you have time to spend with this person um, and listen to what they've been going through. Uh, the next thing to do, obviously, you know, you are not the professional. Your job is to simply ask that question, find out where their head's at, listen to them, validate what they're feeling, and then get them to professional help, right? That is your job, is just, just be the link, be the safe person that can help get them uh, help. So, um, you know, just kind of asking them, you know, who have you talked to about this? Is there somebody that we can call together? Um, you know, so something that I find really helpful is that if you're talking with someone, you can, you know, with their permission, three-way call the suicide prevention lifeline and have a conversation together. And then you can do that warm introduction and warm handoff to the suicide prevention lifeline and not have to say, here's a number, go call them, right? It's kind of a, a more friendly and comfortable situation. Um, for anyone who has never called the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, you can actually call and get advice as well. Um, so, you know, you could dial this number and say, you know, there's a friend I'm really concerned about. I'm not sure how to start this conversation, but here are the things that I've seen, the things that I'm concerned about, what should I do? And they can kind of help walk you through some of that too. So um, definitely a good resource to utilize. Um, so just asking them, you know, can we call the suicide prevention lifeline together? Um, I'm, you can even be vulnerable, right? I'm not even sure what to do, but I know that I want to get you help and I know that they can help us, right? Um, another option is to walk them to the, the school counselor if it's a student, right? Um, and sort of I think direct contact is always good if you can link them directly with a healthcare provider. Of course, when we're talking about the situation that we're all in right now with this physical distancing, I think the lifeline number is a really good option. Um, and we probably should all be practicing that as kind of linking people to help. Now, what if they don't want help? Um, I think it's really important to understand that you cannot force someone to get help. This is ultimately their decision. This is ultimately their responsibility, um, but we can support them through that, right? And so if somebody is a little bit reluctant to get help, I think all we can do is sort of encourage them, give them the resources, and then check in with them later. Uh, like, you know, hey, we had this conversation yesterday. How are you doing with that? Um, were you able to connect with the lifeline or were you able to connect with, um, you know, your counselor or whatever that might be. Um, but just kind of recognize and free yourself from that responsibility that, that while this is an important conversation we need to have, we cannot physically force someone uh, to do that. Uh, some ongoing things to support, right? So after you've referred someone to help, after you've gotten them connected, um, having some additional conversations, I think about, um, you know, what else, can, makes you feel better? You know, what can we do to distract you from these thoughts? I think right now, um, getting people outside, getting people to exercise, uh, you know, taking just time for self-care is so in extremely important right now. Um, but it's also important for them to come up with these things on, our, on their own, because something that might, might help you and might be a coping skill for you might not work for someone else. 
you know. Um, so you definitely don't want to just make a list for them. You want to make sure that they're thinking through these things. Uh, because maybe for me, it's to take a long hot bath, but maybe they don't have a bathtub, right? So we, you can kind of see how they have to come up with these things on their own. Uh, checking in and seeing if they have firearms in the home, prescription medications in the home, anything like that, that could maybe be a risk if they're having these thoughts already. Um, so offering to hold on to their firearms temporarily, helping them lock up medications or lock up their firearms is extremely important. Uh, and then always just checking in later on. You know, hey, I'm gonna call you tomorrow and I'm gonna see how you're doing, okay? But I think the important thing is that uh, we never wanna worry alone in these situations. This is not your sole responsibility to take care of this person. You also have to take care of yourself. Um, also, I mean, the person is gonna be safer if there's additional people involved in the conversation and it's not all falling on you anyways. Um, so, you know, helping them make a plan of, you know, who we can turn to for support. You know, if, who do you trust? Who can we get on our team to support you through this? Um, whether that's a therapist, a family, a friend, you know, a religious leader, um, ultimately, again, reiterating, the person is responsible for saving their own life. You're just there to help support them through that. Okay, don't take on too much of the guilt or responsibility in this um, and understand that you never have to worry alone. There's some resources that um, I think would be particularly helpful. Um, the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, if you don't have this in your phone right now, I would say take out your phone and put this in there now. You never know when you're going to need it, um, so it's best to be prepared. The Trevor Project Lifeline is, and tech service is for LGBTQ plus youth. That's also a really great resource. Uh, 211, if you're not familiar with resources in your area, this is a good number to call and find out what there is for support. Uh, finding out what your local mental health authority provides for mental health treatment services. There's also a lot of really great apps available that can help sort of develop coping skills and safety, safety strategies. Um, and I will actually send out probably an email with a lot of information after this. We are, so my office has purchased a statewide access for the My Strength app, um, which really helps with those sort of coping skills. Um, and so I can send that out to you all with an access code and everybody can download it, uh, anyone in the state. So I'll make sure to send that out as well. Um, so when you can't look on the bright side, I will sit with you in the dark. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, I think this is really representative of what our role is. Our role is not to help someone look on the bright side. Our role is not to um, take full responsibility for this person, but our role is to just be with them during that dark time, to just empathize with them, to understand what they're going through and validate their feelings and just sit with them in the dark and help support them through this. You are one piece of a comprehensive safety net. Again, this is, this is not all on you. We talked about sort of uh, those layers of support that we need to do what we can on an individual level, but there's also all these other layers that are going to keep people safe. What are some things that you can do right now? Um, I think one of the biggest takeaways from this presentation would be to remember that this is physical distancing, not social distancing. So reaching out regularly, your friends, your family, your coworkers, checking in, just seeing how they're doing mentally, right? I think especially now that we're 40 days in, some of us, um, it's a really hard time. And I think even people who were doing okay at the beginning of this are now starting to struggle. And so just kind of making that a regular thing, maybe picking one person each day that you just check in and have like a, 10 minute phone call with. Um, I think that'll be super helpful during this time. Locking up, just as a regular practice, locking up firearms, um, locking up prescription medications. That's something we can easily all do right now, keep our family members safe in our home. Uh, downloading the SafeUT app and the My Strength app. Again, I'll send you that access code. 
putting the lifeline in your phone, and then just taking all signs of suicide seriously. If you notice any of those verbal cues we talked about, any of those behavioral clues, just check in with someone. Just be brave enough to start the conversation. Just assume that no one else is going to have this hard conversation with them and just be there, be there for them. Um, so I and just encourage you to sort of think through what resources are available in your area so that you're prepared to refer someone to help um, if you come across someone who needs it. Um, so kind of summing it up, I guess, combating the social isolation that we're in right now, uh, we need to do this professionally. So in our workplaces, utilizing telehealth services, utilizing virtual meetings, virtual trainings, virtual webinars like we're doing today, to just be able to connect with each other, to see each other's faces. Um, I think that's going to do us a lot of good by the end of all of this. Um, and then personally, I think you know, while it's important to do this all in our work sites, and many of you are attending from work sites today, it's also important to think about the hats you wear in your personal life and think about what you can do to connect with others, um, to Skype with them, see them face to face. Uh, and then think through your own. I, I think self-care is something, you know, we didn't necessarily touch on a ton in this presentation, but I think self-care is extremely important right now. So thinking through what your coping strategies are, you know, how can you relax your body? How can you pace yourself through stressful things you're working on? Take breaks uh, during, if you're working from home, making sure you're standing up every hour. This is something I need to adjust with as well. I think I've been sitting since, you know, 9 a.m. <laughs> so uh, making sure we're getting up, that we're, uh, you know, we're moving around, we're taking care of our mental health, and we're asking for help when we need it. Um, I'll send out all these resources afterwards, but I think I would like to open it up for the last five minutes for any questions. I know that this was a lot of information in a very short amount of time, but that's just sort of where we're at right now um, without being able to do live in-person discussions and presentations. And so um, I will just sort of turn the time back over to Heather maybe for a closing and then invite you all to who have questions to stick around. Yep. So thank you everyone who has come to this and has, has participated and thank you Allison for doing this. This has been awesome. So we're really excited um, that we got the opportunity for this. Um,